morning and i hope everybody is safe first i like to thank dr chat for organizing this excellent academic activity and involving clinicians and physiologists intensive pain physicians from all over the world and by this today we have three eminent speaker with us giving us lecture or share their experience regarding that their uh, field of interest so first the first speaker we have dr sharmili uh, she is present currently working as a senior consultant critical care medicine of apollo hospital of bhubaneswar dr sharmili after doing her md in anesthesiology has done dnb she also cleared european diploma in critical care medicine along with ficcm she has also done advanced training in critical care in australia she has more than 17 year of experience in critical care and has trained lot of juniors Her areas of expertise are neurocritical care, polytrauma, sepsis, ventilation, infect, ventilation, infection control, and nutrition. Along with the academic activity, she is also an active member of the Indian Society of Critical Care Medicine. She was an EC member from 2020 to 2022, and EC member elect from 2022 to 2024. At the same time, she is also a member of XCCM. She has already taken around 65 guest lectures, along with 16 publications in index journals and different. She also contributed in different book chapters. She is a reviewer of national and international journals, and she is presently a presentation at national in doing multiple presentation at national and international meetings like Critical Care Congress and Brussels. So I welcome Dr. Sharmili, and I will request you to start your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Sudipta, for your kind words of appreciation. And uh, dear friends and colleagues, I must say that it's a matter of uh, great pleasure and privilege for me tonight to be part of this excellent academic platform. And I'd like to uh, thank immensely Dr. Sand and the team Mega Learning for this wonderful and uh, opportunity and this academic initiative that they have started. What you said about this journey of Mega Learning is really amazing and praiseworthy. With that words of thanks, actually, I would like to proceed to discuss about one of the very important and interesting aspects of critical care management uh, in ICU. That is about uh, ventilation and winning from ventilations. Now, friends, we know that the ventilator is usually perceived as a life-saving equipment in critical care unit. And now, with this onset of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic for more, which has been existing for more than now one and a half years. The role of anesthesiologist and intensivist have is uh, gaining more uh, prominence, and, uh, and people are acknowledging their role as a frontline workers. Now, ventilator for intensivist and anesthesiologist is actually a right hand tool. We use it very often on a daily basis in the intensive care units. But there is uh, a perception among uh, the public across the world that once a patient who is critically ill is going into ICU and is being put on uh, invasive ventilation. Mostly the patient is going to have a one-way journey and his chances of coming out successfully from the ICU as well as hospital discharge are very bleak. But we know that uh, chances, it is not that grim. The story is not that grim and most of these patients actually do well. They get uh, discharged from ICU as well as the hospital. But obviously when the patient is stuck on the ventilator, it generates a lot of anxiety and concerns among the clinician and also about the family members. So this entails or starts the story about liberation uh, from mechanical ventilations or what we call in short as winning from mechanical ventilations. So the learning objectives of the sessions will be following and I have no disclosure to make. So what do we understand by winning from ventilation? It is a process of reducing ventilator support and allowing the patient to resume greater extent of their own breathing efforts in order to facilitate complete liberation from the ventilator ultimately. Mind it, it is complete liberation from invasive ventilator ultimately. And this is usually done by reducing the support on the ventilator per se and by giving spontaneous breathing trials. So this entails a process to assess the probability for liberation from mechanical ventilation. Now, invasive ventilations actually are instituted for two broad categories, pulmonary and extrapulmonary or non-pulmonary indications. Among pulmonary sections, it is mostly due to pneumonias, bacterial, fungal, or uh, viral pneumonias, ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome from various causes, pulmonary edema, again, uh, cardiac or non-cardiac causes, aspiration pneumonitis, chest traumas, beat, blunt trauma, or penetrating chest traumas, and electively for cardiothoracic surgeries. 
non pulmonary causes entails uh, etiologies like polytrauma and mostly traumatic brain injuries like uh, moderate to severe traumatic brain injuries for comatose patients from different metabolic or septic causes patients who are in multi organ failure with uh, hemodynamic instabilities or those who are electively intubated and ventilated for major surgeries so winning is a continuous process lasting from intubation till hospital discharge these are broadly classified into three categories simple difficult and prolonged simple is when the patient tolerates first spontaneous breathing trial or sbt and is successfully extubated within 72 hours approximately now most of the patients are up to 60 to 70% of patients who are intubated come under this category Difficult winning uh, pertains to patients who fail to tolerate the initial SBT, and successful winning actually requires up to three SBTs or up to seven days from the first spontaneous breathing trial. So it covers up to forty percent of those patients. But prolonged winning is the most uh, challenging one, and here the patient uh, fails at least three SBTs or takes more than seven days to come out of the ventilation after the first spontaneous breathing trial. so discontinuation from mechanical ventilation actually has got two parts it is withdrawal of the mechanical ventilation and part two is the removal of the endotracheal tube we all are aware of the risk of prolonged mechanical ventilations number one is the ventilator induced lung injury itself when the ventilator is uh, instituted to uh, generate or to impart positive pressure it itself starts injuring the brain, lungs due to various mechanisms uh, because the lung is heterogeneously affected by the disease process and application of positive pressure also causes trauma to the pulmonary parenchyma barotrauma and second and most dangerous one is the nosocomial pneumonia that is more precisely ventilator associated pneumonia there occurs also different grades of airway trauma due to repeated suctioning or due to long prolonged placement of the endotracheal tube it gives rise to vocal cord damage or edema and it also demands administration prolonged administration of sedation and muscle paralytic agents to different extents but if you are uh, discontinuing this mechanical ventilation prematurely that has also its own disadvantages and complications and is associated with a higher mortality rate suppose you are uh, extubating a patient prematurely there will be a loss of airway protection as a result the patient might aspirate and may become hypoxemic and becomes more susceptible to hypoxic brain injury subsequently this also generates uh, unnecessary sympathetic discharge and can add up to cardiovascular stress and precipitate acute cardiac events patients might also experience uh, different grades of muscle fatigue if they are already having neuromuscular weakness as a part of critical illness neuro or myopathy or from different causes so it again gives rise to respiratory acidosis so all this actually might lead to reintubation process in a patient who is already compromised and if they are having an edematous airway due to vocal cord swelling or injury down uh, down the line it might pose a challenge during intubations and further hypoxic injuries may be sustained so discontinuation from this mechanical ventilation has got three steps and it better be followed every time for every patients number one is we have to assess if the patient is ready to be winded off number two is the winning process itself and then last process is the extubations we would definitely like to emphasize that winning from ventilation is actually a multi system approach and the lungs are only the part players of the whole show the whole game so there are three key points uh, in the criteria for winning first and foremost the problem for which the patient was intubated must be resolved number two there got to be some measurable criteria that need to be assessed to establish that this patient is ready for discontinuation of ventilation and number three a spontaneous breathing trial must be also given to see that if a patient is again ready for winning or not so now let's look at uh, the etiologies which are actually make it uh, difficult to win patients these are they are broadly divided into five headings respiratory ventilatory cardiac psychological machine or ventilator circuit or nutritional coming to respiratory these are again subdivided into different headings first is the increased ventilator demand it could be due to the refractory hypoxia or hypercarbia increased dead space which may be due to the primary disease per se or due to micro thrombi or thromboembolism which is most commonly seen these days in covid related ards cases or metabolic acidosis which could be due to 
the multi part of the multi organ problems or neuropsychiatric factors if associated increased resistive load could be due to bronchial spasm or airway edema airway edema could be due to the endotracheal tube itself or due to the injuries or fluid overload states Elast increased elastic load can exist in the form of dynamic hyperinflation or due to the alveolar disease which may be part of the primary disease again Pleural pathologies like pleural effusions also contribute many times, especially in patients who have got abdominal pathologies due to pancreatitis or cell pneumonic effusions exist. Chest wall components like pneumothorax or abdominal distensions also play a part. Abdominal distension, especially when there is an acute abdomen or there is intestinal obstruction, it compresses the lungs, it splints the diaphragm, and as a result, it generates a lot of VQ mismatches, and that uh, makes it uh, difficult to win. Reduced neuromuscular capacity also an important factor in winning always. It could be due to simple factors like dyselectrolytemia from either hypokalemia or hypomagnesemia or hypophosphatemia. Of all these, hypophosphatemia, phosphate deficiency is usually missed and overlooked and it's difficult to diagnose as well. So one, during this winning process, this has to be looked into, especially in patients who are chronically malnourished or are alcoholics. Critical illness, polyneuropathy, and critical illness myopathy are very, very important impeders uh, for successful winning. And we are always concerned about this, more so now with this COVID uh, pandemic times, because of the increased usage of drugs like uh, steroids and increased usage of uh, paralytic agents in uh, ARDS cases, and some of the antibiotics like uh, cholestin or aminoglycosides, which are used to treat this resistant organisms. Now let's look at the cardiac factors because these are very, very important and you know it's a very uh, kind of takes a vicious cycle in during the winning process many times. The winning itself may induce ischemic changes. As you see, once uh, we start winning uh, the positive pressures, the intrathoracic pressure decreases. So it actually increases the systemic venous return, which uh, in turn in increases the left ventricular afterload and preload. There is pulmonary vascular resistance increase due to different degrees of blood gas mismatch like hypoxia or hypocarbia, it increases the work of breathing. And so in turn, it can precipitate myocardial ischemia. So as a result, there is decrease in the left ventricular compliance and also due to increase in the vascular pulmonary resistance, RV dilatation occurs, which can again affect the left ventricular compliance due to biventricular interdependence. So all this as a result increases the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. And right hand dysfunctions also exist to different degrees among patients, especially those with who have got chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or chronic kidney disease or other chronic uh, interstitial lung diseases. Diastole dysfunction is very commonly present and uh, as a cause of 30% heart failure in ICU. But unfortunately, it gets overlooked in most of the cases unless you start thinking about it. Pulmonary edema can happen due to, again, uh, the pump failure or uh, systolic dysfunctions and fluid overloads can happen. It is usually due to the cumulative fluid balance, which the patient might have received during the initial days of the ICU resuscitations. So once the patient starts stabilizing, we have to definitely address the cumulative fluid balance and work on it. Psychological components are um, definitely an invaluable part of the winning uh, protocol. Most of these patients uh, during the difficult or uh, prolonged winning process they get uh, affected by depression and anxiety because they are you know, trapped in one place and they're separated from their near and dear ones. They have lost orientation of the day and night cycles. And many times also we see that it's an acute dysfunction of the brain, that which we call delirium. And most of these patients are also confronted with the problem of pain because when they're lying for a prolonged period of time and they're you know, hooked onto many machines and pipes from all places, it definitely gives rise to pain and they are having the disadvantage that not able to express it properly. Now, there are numerous scores, uh, as you know, has been envisaged to assess their pain scores, but I must say this is usually not adequately addressed. As a result, uh, they have a component of pain all the time, unless it is really looked into on the daily rounds. So nutritional aspects is also, and again, another contributory factor towards the winning process. All the disease process which, for which the patient is hooked onto the ventilator and is in the unit for a long period of time. 
they have a great degree of catabolic state in their body. And unless we are looking at the nutrition very meticulously, they do or do not uh, able. They are not able to get out of that this catabolic state. So uh, it must be uh, ensured that they get their adequate uh, doses of calories and proteins on a daily basis. Calories up to a tune of 20 to 25 calories per day, and proteins up to around two grams per kg per day. Now we have to, you know, until uh, ways how we can divide, give or administer these calories and proteins, because many times patients who are on ventilator they tend due to either sedation or over sedation or due to their uh, multi organ dysfunction they tend to reject feed by and there is increased nasogastric aspirate. We have to make sure that we are giving the different kind of formulas or partially digested peptides, or you, at least if required, can also give partial parental nutritions to ensure adequate calories and proteins. Now, ventilatory circuits or the machine parts are also responsible sometimes. Mostly the old and faulty machines can have exhalation valve dysfunctions, which are undiagnosed unless you start thinking about it for a patient otherwise who is doing well, but is confronting problems in the winning. That could be simple problems like endotracheal tube narrowing or block or increase equipment dead space due to miscellaneous or unnecessary attachments. So we should think of winning as soon as the patient is put on mechanical ventilation, we must know the disease and the etiology, low pressure ventilation is preferable. Uh, we must say that for patients who are on ventilator due to non-pulmonary pathologies, usually their airway pressures, either peak or plateau, go maximally up to 20 or 25 centimeter of water. But for those who are uh, having ARDS, they are usually guided by this ARDS net protocol and it uh, suggests or advocates for a peak pressure less than around 30 to 32 centimeter of water. But I must say that in clinical practice, we actually witness patients who mount their pressures up to 35 or 40, especially if you do not have other options to uh, just simple ventilator. So those patients also have to be addressed or handled uh, accordingly. We must avoid patient ventilator asynchrony Valve prevention bundle checklist must be checked on a daily basis and fluid balance must be addressed meticulously and wisely. And this ABCD protocol we'll just discuss in the next slide. Just before that, regarding this patient ventilator asynchrony, I must say these are three points where it, there are potential for generation of asynchrony. A is the trigger which causes the breath to begin. It could be pressure or flow. Now B is the limit which regulates gas flow during the breath. And C is the cycling, which causes the breath to end. So the new modes of ventilations, like this pressure assist mode, or automatic tube compensation, or NAVA, et cetera, they have been um, advocated to address uh, this patient ventilator asynchrony better than the conventional modes. But let me share with you that the literature does not uh, uh, support that these newer modes are superior to the conventional modes in terms of uh, better patient uh, ventilator asynchrony. Even if whatever evidence is that it is a flow grade, nevertheless, they are being used in different parts of the world and people have their different uh, experiences and expert opinion on this. This is just an example of types of patient ventilatory asynchrony that can arise due to triggering problems during the phase of inspiration or expirations. So what is ABCDE? I think this is a very simple and useful approach that we must adopt on a daily basis. A and B stands for awakening and breathing trial coordination. So you have to daily see if the patient is awakeable or not, and if he can obey your command or not. The choice of sedatives and analgesic have to be accordingly addressed. D for delirium monitoring on a daily basis, and E for early mobility and exercise. So all these four bundles or circles when put together increases the chance of liberation from ventilator early, earlier ICU and hospital discharge, further early return to normal brain function and independent functional status, and overall thus increases survival. Surviving sepsis campaign guidelines also have some suggestions or advocacy regarding sedation, analgesia, and neuromuscular blockade in these patients. They do advocate for adequate and proper analgesics. Actually, there is more emphasis on proper analgesics because, as I mentioned, pain is a very important part for these patients who are all hooked onto so many machines, so many pipes and catheters. And sedation protocols better be guided by some protocol in the unit. 
an intermittent and bolus continuous infusion with uh, daily interruptions is also being proposed. But I would make a point here that exceptions are usually made to patients of ARDAs who are on higher ventilator supports because it is very unusual for a patient who is having ARDAs to improve uh, quickly within the uh, first three to five days. So I, as in my practice, usually tend to keep them on uh, full sedation for up to day two, day three to day five. And thereafter, we start lightening the sedation to ensure their awakening. Muscle paralysis, of course, can stop after 48 to 72 hours and then be given either as an infusion or bolus as required. But sedation, especially for patients who are on higher uh, ventilator support, must be uh, left alone for at least first five to three to five days. And thereafter, you start reducing because once the patient is in, uh, disrupted, this equilibrium takes a long time to come back to normal. And in the process, hypoxia, hypercarbia, and the blood gas exchanges, you know, get affected badly. So when it is done properly, it has been shown to decrease the duration of mechanical ventilation, loss of stay both in ICU and hospital, and lowers the tracheostomy rates. Neuromuscular blockade, as I said, better be stopped by 40 to 72 hours. And thereafter, as necessary, we can uh, always use it. We are fortunate that we have this ultra short acting agents these days, like uh, cisetracurium or um, tracurium. And but if you're there, you're being used inappropriately for a long period of time, they are subtly responsible for causing prolonged muscular weakness and what we see later on as critical illness by apathy later on. Daily ICU scoring, CAM ICU scoring must be followed and it is very important for patients during the winning time because unless the patient cooperates, it is becomes very difficult or challenging for the intensivist to win off the ventilator. Other scores like Ramsey or uh, RAS scores are also followed for this purpose. But sedation must include analgesia for ICU patients who are on ventilator. Now, physiotherapy, I must say, is a very important part and partial of any winning protocol or process in an ICU. It varies from uh, level one to level four. For an unconscious patient, just to do this uh, passive range of motions or turning. But as the patient becomes more conscious and cooperative, their level of activity is very important. They're made to sit, then they are made to sit by the edge of the bed with the legs hanging uh, quite a few times a day. And then they are made to be transferred out of the bed onto the chair. So I would say if you have a very dedicated and competent physiotherapy team in your unit, one third to one fourth of the winning job is already done. This is an example of an elderly patient in my unit who was sitting by the side of the bed and then he's sitting out of the bed and he's keeping himself busy with the newspapers. That's a very pleasant sight. Uh, regarding uh, fluid balance and winning, ARDS no, net protocol actually strictly advocates for restrictive fluid strategy and uh, because positive fluid balance is associated with winning failure and prolonged ventilator days. Role of diuretics is definitely has to be customized according to the patients and during rounds we must look at the cumulative fluid balances because in the initial period of uh, for first to day four usually patients receive a lot of fluids either as part of resuscitations or due to a non-adjustment of different medications but thereafter the fluid must be looked at very meticulously and, and as necessary we should be keeping them at uh, even balanced or negative fluid balance and use uh, the diuretics as necessary, either if you can check about this from the x-rays or if you have an ultrasound from the B lines. BMP has an important role. I, and I use it in, often in my clinical practice. A multi uh, study in 2012 did support that diuretics guided by uh, BNP measurements actually can shorten the duration of winning process. Another randomized control trial of 2006 actually is also uh, supports the use of a conservative fluid strategy for shortening the duration of mechanical ventilation. Now that we have known these risk factors, how do we assess readiness to win a patient who is conscious and alert? We must look for adequate oxygenations. Number two is hemodynamic instability, and the patient must be uh, able to initiate an inspiratory effort. Regarding hemodynamic instability, sorry, stability, we must ensure that the patient uh, is either off vasopressors or inotropes or is on a very low dose of vasopressors or inotropes to maintain his blood pressure. And the intact airway protective mechanism must be there. Patient must be at least uh, appropriately conscious and cooperative, must be having an uh, intact cuff 
reflex and intact gag reflex. Otherwise, the patient might aspirate and might again end up with aspiration pneumonitis and mostly it becomes an hospital acquired pneumonia with this uh, resistant infected bugs. And also he should have a functional respiratory muscle to support a strong and effective cuff. So this is a very important slide. I would like, your like to draw your attention. So these are the winning parameters. And on daily basis, we must uh, keep this in mind while winning a patient. Respiratory rate, preferably less than 30 per minute. Spontaneous idle volume, around 4 ml per kg. Inspiratory pressures, more than preferably 30 centimeter of water, minus 30 centimeter of water. Breathing index, that is uh, frequency, that is the respiratory divided by tidal volume in liters. It should be less than preferably 100 to 105. Heap, again, preferably less than 8. PF ratio, preferably 150 to 200, but also it can be customized to 120 in patients who have uh, pre-existing lung diseases like CLD, sorry, ILD, interstitial lung disease or COPDs, and if I to preferably less than 0 0.5. This frequency by volume ratio is very important and one of the most predictive bedside parameters. If this ratio is more than 105, that is 95% chance that the winning attempts will be unsuccessful. On the other hand, if it is less than 105, there is 80% of chance that the winning attempt will be successful. So how do you go about the spontaneous breathing trials? Either you give it by PSV trials or TPS trials or SIMB. What the new winning modes that we discussed? But actually among these, SIMB has been found to increase the work of breathing and prolong the winning duration. During my early postgraduate days, actually we're using SIMB mode to win the patients. But later on, gradually we learned that this is not a comfortable way or mode to uh, start uh, breathing trials and PSV or TPS trials can be attempted. So what are the criteria used in several large trials to different tolerance of an SBT? This is... Uh, usually taken up or accepted as a gas exchange acceptability where the SpO2 is more than 85 to 90 percent. Now COVID has taught us that uh, lower oxygen levels can be accepted provided your perfusion status is good. PO2 more than 50 to 60 milliliters of mercury and pH preferably 7.25 to 7.32. Hemodynamic stability is assessed as absence of tachycardia or a heart rate uh, less than 120 to 140 or uh, systolic blood pressure more than 90 and less than 180. So both hypotension and hypertension are not desirable. And there should be a stable respiratory pattern. There should be no tachycardia and patients certainly should not be in respiratory distress. So these are tolerable criteria for assessing a spontaneous breathing trial. So opposite of those are indicators of failure of a winning trial. What are those? Like again, if you're a tachypneic, one is having respiratory distress, patient is not ready for uh, winning, Patient is hemodynamically unstable, like patient is having tachycardia, or there is bradycardia, or if there is uh, hypertension more than 180, or hypotension less than 90. And if the gas exchange is also is severely suffering, like PO2 is falling less than 50, or saturation is less than 85 or 80 percent, patient is not going to do well. But and of course, if the patient is becoming uptended or drowsy, then patient is also not going to tolerate a winning process. But these are these figures, these numbers that we discussed are absolutely not uh, absolute acceptable figures. This must be customized according to each and every patient because in the COVID uh, ARDS patients or COVID hypoxic patients, we have seen that something phenomenon of silent hypoxia. Patients do very well even with a PO2 of 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury. That is something surprising that we had not seen before this uh, COVID pandemics. But now we have come to terms with these. And even if a patient is conscious and is perfusing perfectly with the low numbers of SpO2, say less than 85 or 80 to 85 percent or a PO2 of 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury. And but the adequate perfusion status is there, it is to be accepted. Now, what do you understand by adequate perfusion status? It means that end organ perfusion is good, that if a patient is conscious and alert, obeying commands, uh, passing good amount of urine, and this periphery is a warm, and if you are doing a lactate level that is normal, we consider the perfusion to be adequate. So it has to be accepted. Now, which modality you use when you are winning a patient from a ventilator? PSB, CPAP, and all this. And what is the time duration? 30 minutes versus two hours, which is good. Let's see this large trial, which was published in JAMA 2019. It was one of the 
largest trials in this uh, pros prospect. And it does show that 30 minutes PSV uh, spontaneous breathing trial is superior to a two hour TPS trial, spontaneous breathing trial. So the P value was significant. And you can see here this uh, graph that a successful extubation was achieved in patients who were put on 30 minutes PSV trial on the ventilator compared to those who had two hour TPS trials as a spontaneous breathing trial. So this definitely uh, proves or supports that an SBT consisting of 30 minutes PSV compared to two hours TPS trial led to significant higher rates of successful extubation. So which kind of uh, what uh, winning protocol should we be following in our unit? So it should be ideally guided by the simple uh, strategies like A, B, C, D, E, which we discussed. If your patient is stable, the primary pathology has largely resolved, patient is uh, awake, is comfortable, has good muscle power, we should start reducing the sedation and monitor for the delirium, assess for the spontaneous awakening trial, and is patient doing well, go for spontaneous breathing trial. Then consider extubation, provided all those ex parameters that we discussed are uh, met, or at least some of these are met. And if they're doing well, then you can go for extubation and continue to monitor them. If they're not doing well, you have to again go back and pass the steps in the circle. So if uh, somebody is failing this uh, SBTs, we have to look for the cause. Again, if the primary pathology has actually resolved or not, Auto PEEP, which could be due related to the ventilator and the patient's uh, or hyperinflations or retention of uh, inadequate expirations. That could be pump failures, both from the heart or due to ventilator muscles, which could be part of this neuromuscular weakness or critical illness, neuropathy or myopathy. <clears throat> nervous system, both central and peripheral nervous system, has to be looked into it. Look, and metabolic parameters and electrolytes also need to be taken care of, mostly the sodium, potassium, and magnesium and phosphates. Chronic lung diseases definitely must be kept in mind while winning these patients or if you're, you know, these are impeding uh, winning process like coronary artery disease, COPDs, interstitial lung disease, or pre-existing diseases like myasthenia gravis. So what is extubation failure? It means uh, restitution of the ventilator support within 24 to 72 hours of planned tracheal tube removal. It happens for up to 5 to 10% of extubated patients. The pathophysiology could be an imbalance between the muscle capacity on work or breathing. That could be upper airway uh, obstruction, res excess respiratory secretions, which a patient is not able to cough out due to inadequate cough, encephalopathies, and of course, a cardiac dysfunction is severely interferes with this owning process if it is not optimized prior. To predict the chances of a post-extubation strider, or we can always use this cuff leak test when the tidal volume is assessed after and before uh, deflating the cuff. And if the leak is around have a value of around 130 millimeters, it has a sensitivity of 85% and a specificity of 95% to identify patients who have an increased chance of post-extubation strider. Role of NIV in Uini is actually is absolutely uh, wonderful, and we use this actually more often these days, either the proper NIV or even BiPAP machines. It's very useful in acute exacerbation of COPD cases or those who have got congestive heart failure or left ventricular failure uh, due to either systolic uh, dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction or combined dysfunctions. And if a patient, uh, so this way, if a patient is hemodynamically stable, he is adequately oxygenating and is able to protect his airway, then and respiratory secretions are also minimum with an intact uh, cough reflex, these patients can be directly extubated and put on NIV under supervision. And even in units, smaller units, you can use the BiPAP machines. Now, tracheostomy has definitely a role in uh, uh, prolonged winning. If a patient has altered sensorium, muscular weakness, polytrauma, mostly the traumatic brain injuries, they need prolonged ventilatory support. So go for this early. But appropriate timing has to be chosen because if you are doing too many tracheostomies in your unit, it could be a concern and add to the workload for your staffs. Parkinson is, is certainly uh, better and is widely accepted and practiced world over. So... Now, summarizing this protocol-driven winning, mechanical ventilation, if you have instituted, once you've achieved these goals of PFFA ratios, PPS less than eight, you have intact error reflexes, your sedations and vasopressors are off, 
check for this rapid swallow breathing index if less than 100. Rest for, sorry, more than 100, you rest for 24 hours. If it is less than 100, you go for the spontaneous breathing trial. You can try, reduce the pressure support and keep his breathing. And if this patient's uh, respiratory rate, look for these parameters, if they can tolerate or not. If they can tolerate and protect the airway, you go for extubations. If the patient is not able to meet this uh, parameters, then he has to be gone back to mechanical ventilation and try again after 24 to 48 hours. So prolonged winning, how do we do go about it? If your patient is still fails at least three SBTs or takes more than seven days after SBT, tracheostomy, you can always think of with a speaking valve because this actually increases the confidence level when they start speaking and are able to communicate more effectively. You have to ensure that there is normal hemostasis and strict asepsis, good nutrition, the so normal uh, basic intensive care protocol has to be followed. You have to be very careful and uh, proactive in uh, preventing uh, critical illness, polyneuropathy and myopathy. Tight tysmic control has got a direct evidence of benefit in these cases in preventing uh, critical illness, polyneuropathy and myopathy. Also, the drugs like corticosteroids and paralytic agents that are used, especially now in the context of COVID-19 patients, we see these, they have evidence for harm. And indirect evidence for benefit applies to the sedation sparing protocols and early mobilizations, definitely. And of course, optimal nutrition and uh, electrolyte management contribute to this. Echo and ultrasound has become a part and partial of critical care uh, units all across the world, mostly in the last uh, decade and they are of immense help in assessing cardiac status, lung, pleura and diaphragms, assessing the fluid status and the cardiac dysfunctions of all kinds, diastolic, systolic and right heart dysfunctions or pulmonary hypertension. So if uh, there is an increase in the E by E ratio with normal systolic functions, it is points towards usually diastolic dysfunctions. Now, diastolic dysfunction is uh, very common in patient kind of population who get hospitalized and are admitted to ICU on ventilator, yet underdiagnosed. Mostly patients who have got chronic hypertension, diabetes mellitus, obesity, and overaged, they do get this problem. And low BNP is a good marker for uh, uh, indicating this diastolic dysfunctions. They can be handled well with judicious use of diuretics, beta blockers, and ACE inhibitors. Fluid restriction strategies are helpful and BiPAPs, intermittent BiPAPs after extubation is actually helps uh, to a large extent to these patients. Even at the home setup, they can be given when they're discharged from the hospital. Pulmonary hypertension should be treated appropriately with sildenafil or calcium channel blockers. So ventilator associated pneumonia, it is one of the menaces that can actually affect the winning process and actually inadvertently increase the length of stay in the ICU and the hospital. So prevention of the secondary infections remain the key. VAP care bundle is very essential and must be looked at uh, by uh, the caring staff and the treating team on an everyday basis in uh, all the shifts. Elevation of the head end by 30 to 45 degrees, daily sedative interruptions and daily assessment for readiness to extubate, peptic also prophylaxis, DVT prophylaxis, and oral care is very important because all these patients who are intubated with an endotracheal tube in the mouth Oral care is usually suboptimal, and they are the that is the place where it gets to tend uh, colonized with this resistant bacteria and in the upper pharynx as well. So oral care with the chlorhexidine at least uh, once in every shift is indispensable. Early mobilization and physiotherapy are also very important part and partial of this. Fast tag bits. These are the basics of intensive care. I'll just uh, show this, and these all these components are essential for wholesome care of these patients because a patient who is overall well will be able to successfully wind off from the ventilation. Now, the million dollar question comes, is winning different in COVID-19 patients? My answer would be no, because uh, be it COVID-related ARDS or non-COVID-related ARDS or any pathology for which the patient is stuck to the ventilator for a prolonged period of time, they all need practically at the end of the day good, robust, intensive care. So we must stick to basics. We have to learn to know our oxygenation goals and need to target the adequate end organ perfusions, not just the numbers. And we have to learn to limit the steroids up to 10 days, not beyond 10 days. And the dose also not very high in those 10 days period. 
you have to again limit the paralytic agents within 40 to 72 hours and use it judiciously afterwards if necessary. Early mobilization again remains the key and prevention secondary infections is utmost important. Last but not the least is about identifying futility in eligible patients because very old patients, more than 70, 75 year old patients who have multiple comorbid conditions, suppose they have interstitial lung diseases, um, overall global hypokinesia or in advanced cancer, we must identify those patients and probably should not be put them on prolonged ventilation or try to wean them off because usually it uh, gives negative results. So to summarize the take home message, I would say be optimistic and uh, because ventilator is a friend, not a foe. Outcome is usually successful in 60 to 70% of cases because simple weaning is possible in those cases when the primary cause is taken care of. Only difficult and prolonged weaning happens in uh, maybe 10 to 40% of cases and is usually a multifactorial task for which we have to identify the etiologies and all the risk factors for this difficult or prolonged weaning that we discussed. Spontaneous breathing trial is usually preferred and a shorter trial on the PSB mode is preferred over prolonged TPS trials. Tracheostomy, we must contemplate early in appropriate uh, subset of patients and our ventilator winning goals need to be individualized and customized according to the patient because one size does not fit all. So those numbers are numbers and it is the patient at the end of the day and the clinician has to decide his goals by the his or her goals by the bedside. So basic good intensive care is must for successful winning from ventilation. At the end, I would say that successful winning is always a very robust teamwork. It's not possible without a robust teamwork. And I'm proud to show my team in the intensive care unit. And this is a patient who is 88 year old and we are able to win him off from ventilator and he's sitting out of the bed. Thank you very much, my dear friends and colleagues. I stop here. Thank you, Dr. Shamili. I'll stop sharing. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Shamili, for an excellent and elaborate presentation covering all aspects of ventilator winning, along with the supportive care, which are very, very important beyond cardiorespiratory support to take this patient successfully out of the ventilator. Now, we have some questions. Some of them you have already answered. Uh, First is your experience in winning COVID-related ARDS patients effect of, and effect of delayed intubation in these patients. Because we know we in COVID, we have tried to stretch them on NHFNC or BiPAP and try to delay the intubation. Do you think they are doing little differently or you are having a different plan in winning these patients? Yeah, uh, Dr. Sudipta, these are very uh, crucial questions because uh, this is something different uh, we see now in this COVID times, uh, patients who are uh, having respiratory failure related to COVID-19 are behaving actually very different to those patients who are having non-COVID pathologies and ending up in uh, respiratory failure. So generally, my observation is a patient, we are delaying uh, intubation in patients who are appropriate or suitable for intubation. Those who are fulfilling the criteria of intubation, but if we are delaying intubations, these patients, once they go into uh, invasive ventilations, they usually take long time to be wind off from the ventilation. Now, the causes could be obvious, like because those time period where actually we delayed the process of intubation, they might have aspirated. And as I said, in an intensive care unit, the oral and the oropharynx is having actually harboring a lot of uh, resistant organisms and the colonized organisms, they tend to go inside and due to this aspiration process, they also contribute to the hospital like for pneumonias. So along with the primary pathologies, these uh, nosocomial pneumonias, they are making the situation more complicated and it becomes very difficult to diagnose these cases at the within the first four, uh, seven weeks because conducting uh, bronchoscopy or collecting samples for these patients is challenging. They tend to be on very high supports. So yes, delaying intubation in these cases makes the screening difficult subsequently. And another experience what we, I have seen that because these patients even when they're improving, they come down to or improve to a certain level, then they're stuck to a certain respiratory support. Maybe at 40%, maybe at 50% oxygen, they're stuck and we could not take them off the, from that support and eventually they needed tracheostomy. Do you have similar experience? Yeah, true, true. Because after one level, as I mentioned, I think the VAB bundle, the prevention of secondary infections for COVID-19 patients who have started recovering is very, very important. 
because uh, the use of steroids and other immunomodulator drugs, actually these patients per se become very susceptible to secondary infections. And uh, now we know that uh, inf infection control practices are not ideal in COVID units because of the restrictions and because of the kind of staffing patterns we have and the doctor and the nurses are new. If they are not very trained, then infection control practices are all also optimal. So all this combinedly actually predispose them to further uh, secondary infections. And once those infections set in, it becomes a very difficult challenge and take, becomes a vicious cycle to wean them off from the ventilator. But once if you can subsequently, you can prevent the secondary infections, that the key remains limiting the use of steroids. Now with this preprint this preprint has come regarding the use of steroids in this covid-19 patients and we see that uh, you know if you are using uh, less than around 6 mg of uh, dexona or dexamethasone for up to 10 days that is good enough as much as uh, 12 mg so if you are reducing like using less dose and less duration both are very important contributors for preventing uh, secondary infections so this is a key point which differentiates these patients from non covid-19 uh, related ARDS. Right, excellent. And as you mentioned, the lot all the studies have shown that low dose steroid may help, and probably we are using high dose out of our desperation when the patient is not improving. Right, so true, question, truly so. And next question, you have already covered that in whom we can extubate on NIV and the role of newer mode uh, mode for weaning. This part we have already covered that you can COPD and uh, congested heart failure patients, and the newer modes doesn't at least. As per evidence, is not supportive of newer modes for yeah. weaning. Form. Right. Uh, regarding newer modes, I would like to say that uh, for more than 15 years, this has been in existence and in practice, especially this uh, adaptive support ventilations, pressure uh, adaptive uh, ventilation, and this uh, NAVA, and the other one is the PRVC mode. So they are very new. Uh, different companies have incorporated these softwares and are uh, these are in already in use in market. And their main point or principle has been uh, that they ensure or more uh, patient ventilator synchrony. But in if you look at literature, none have actually established superiority over compared to the conventional modes of ventilation. But yes, it becomes sometimes easier in, in terms of number when you're using this ASV or by uh, bi-level ventilation or this uh, PRVC modes in patients who are difficult to ventilate. But in terms of superiority for asynchrony or outcome, like liberation from ventilator, they have not established evidence. Right, right. And any specific strategy for morbidly obese patient undergoing bariatric surgery from your conventional conventional plan of winning? Yes, I think um, obesity is one of the very important factors uh, which can impede uh, successful winning. So I think they are, it's not very specific, but again, you have to follow the same principles. Like These patients are, tend to have other uh, comorbid conditions like hypertension, diabetes, you know, they might be dyslipidemia, and diastolic dysfunction or right heart dysfunction. This must be assessed properly before the patient is taken up for uh, surgery. And in the post-operative periods, and we have to have actually greater degree uh, level of uh, PEEP for them. For them, actually, we can extubate them with higher level of PEEP up to eight. And subsequently, we can directly put them on electively on NIV or BiPAPs to keep the lungs expanded because of the you know obesity and the fat that tend to have more of basal atelectasis, which contribute to more VQ mismatch in the post-operative period. And also there is printing due to the surgery and uh, pain. So these patients also can be post-operatively uh, definitely considered for NIV or BiPAPs. Okay. Because contrary to the conventional belief that in upper GI surgery, you cannot give an NIV, this is probably one of those surgeries when it is recommended and there is very strong evidence suggesting to put them empirically or preemptively on non-invasive ventilation, at least on CPAP, to prevent All the right. basal atelectasis and have a better post-operative outcome. Right. And next, next we have another question that what do you have any experience using hormonal support in case of difficult weaning, like growth hormone supplementation? Growth hormone supplementation, no. I, we do not uh, uh, have not assessed this, but a couple of times in terms of hormone, I would say two hormones like uh, this cortisol levels and thyroid hormone. A couple of times, I mean, not a couple of times, many occasions we have uh, checked these levels for patients, patients because, you know, for various reasons, patient is either slow or you know, obese, and there may be undetected cases of hypothyroidism. So these cases, we have evaluated them for uh, their thyroid status, and either hypo or hyperthyroid status have been treated. 
especially I'd like to mention about the role of thyroid and glycemic control. Few patients we find that whatever you're giving the low doses of insulin, the sugar does not get control. So for those patients, if you have, you must check that thyroid level because gross hypothyroid or hyperthyroid state actually can uh, cause dysregulation of this glycemic control. And glycemic control in itself is an independent risk factors for, for prolonged weaning and all other complications possible in an uh, ICU patient. So thyroid and number two is the cortisol. Mostly in the last uh, three or two, four years, we have seen that uh, patients, especially those uh, traumatic brain injury patients during the process of weaning, they can tend to drop their blood pressures off and on. And when we have randomly checked their fasting for their uh, early morning cortisol levels, they become precipitously low for some unknown reasons. For those patients, we have started adding this uh, tablets, oral supplements, and we have got good results. But other than that, both hormone we have not tried in winning protocols. Right. Same here. I also don't have any experience in terms of growth hormone. But there are some okay. literature which suggests that it can increase the, because it's anabolic hormone, so it can increase your muscle mass. And in a chronic debilitating patient who is on ventilator, tracheostoma is for very long duration. In long run, it may help. But again, I also don't have any experience. Any esteemed senior panelist, if you have experience with growth hormone, may share quickly. Because we don't have any experience with growth hormone. Dr. Sharmini, uh, lately, actually in the last issue of uh, Journal of Anesthesiology and Clinical Pharmacology, there's come up a come, rip case report. There's a case series from uh, Medical College Chandigarh, wherein they showed that yes, testosterone has been used to improve the critical illness myoneuropathy. And they have used for as a weaning uh, help, uh, that is use right, of testosterone, sorry. not only the decoderabilin, but the testosterone has been used. And they are uh, beyond that publication. They have used over, I have friends over there who had been uh, discussing around that around in 16 patients, they have used the testosterone. The testosterone available as of in India is uh, 40 milligram. And although the recommendations are for 10 milligram, so uh, they have used. Like, right, like this so is, I think uh, we need more data on that, but it's yeah, certainly yes, interesting to know this prospect. Yes, yeah. Because as, as Dr. Sudipta was saying, that being an anabolic hormone, uh, it, it is being used uh, these days. Right. Right. And another interesting question, Dr. Sharmili, that uh, do you find any differ difference in practice or experience in winning in the, uh, in the first wave and the second wave? Do you find any difference in different COVID mutation in your winning process? Yes, certainly. That's a very important, I think it touches my heart because I do find difference. In the first wave, actually, we're quite busy still. we The ventilator patients did well and uh, our uh, success rate was up to 50 to 60 percent for these ARDS patients. But unlike in the second wave, we see these patients, once they go into invasive ventilation, actually, they are, first of all, they are in an extreme catabolic state. And number two, they are requiring very high level of uh, ventilator support and more episodes of cloning compared to the first wave to maintain their oxygenation goals. Even we accept very low, we have lowered down our expectations in terms of oxygenations, like 50, 45 also we have accepted provided the perfusion status is goal, uh, st perfusion status is adequate, but still they require very high support for a prolonged period of time. And number three is uh, probably because we are using higher steroid this time, they tend to catch secondary infections faster, earlier than compared patients in the first wave. So once these patients catch a secondary infections, it becomes very difficult or extremely difficult task to wean them off. But uh, I think, yes, uh, we have not used immunomodulators, but uh, number four is also increased usage of neurovascular agents in these cases we are doing because we are finding it difficult to establish our uh, ventilation goals plus patient ventilator synchrony. So I think this is probably, this is the very important difference that we see compared to the first wave, wave and also about the in higher usage of these anticoagulations. We are using higher doses, more, almost therapeutic doses of um, anticoagulation for all these patients because even it's not guided by D-dimer, it is only just by observation and our personal experience that most of these patients somewhere either are experiencing micro or macro episodes of uh, pulmonary thromboembolism. Few patients, if they're not, uh, may be having a obstructive shock due to pulmonary embolism, they're dying. Or if not, actually these patients are taking long time to come off the ventilator. So for that reason, also you're using higher anticoagulation. So these are, I think, six points which is different from the first wave in our practice. Agreed. I think I will agree on most of them because I have the similar experience. 
and here dr ahmed khatab has also shared his experience regarding using of steroid anabolic steroid hormones in facilitating difficult winning but in a specific subgroup of patient like adolescent with muscular dystrophy as we are discussing that patient who have a neuromuscular weakness muscle dystrophy probably anabolic hormone may help but exactly we need more data regarding this so probably the last question though it is not directly related to your presentation that uh, uh, what will be the best mode or parameter according to you for lung protective ventilation in ards patients when the winning can be easy any so, any uh, you prefer any new any mode you prefer in case of ventilating the ards patient in terms of lung protective ventilation yeah particular mode see the lung ards protocol what say they have set set goals for us they say the peak pressure or the plateau pressure be preferably less than 30 to 32 cm of water your tidal volumes maximum up to 6 mm uh, 6 ml per kg could be adequate oxygenation goals by ards on and from all other literature that we have gathered we can accept lower oxygenation goals like 85% of spo2 or po2 as low as 50 if our adequate perfusion status is adequate so combining all these the mode i would say you can either use a volume mode or a pressure control mode in my unit we use usually the pressure control mode i must say one thing here that it, it doesn't depend what particular mode as the doctor or the intensivist is comfortable with it has to be the whole team who must be comfortable and acquainted with that particular mode because the winning is a continuous process and it is the your team like the junior doctors or the paramedics nurses or the technician who is present by the best side or the therapist who is at the bed side who should be doing, acquainted with the ventilator so you can both uh, use the pressure mode or the volume mode if you are using the volume mode you look at your peak pressures or plateau pressures if you are using your pressure mode then look at the volume but at the end of this ventilation your target should be adequate oxygenation carbon dioxide and this pressures these three parameters if these are adequate and if your perfusion status is adequate that's all you you are aiming for i right. hope you have i've answered the question right 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 because none of the studies has shown that whether volume or pressure control bed mode or any other newer mode is better than one or another it is more important to address the appropriate cause appropriate physiological parameters and preventing bleed that would be the and most I, more important but i do agree with the person who has put up the question that it very often it comes to mind that which mode we should be using volume yes. mode or pressure mode so i would again summarize that it doesn't matter which mode If you are using a volume mode, look at your pressures. If you are using a pressure mode, look at the volumes and target your uh, endpoints like the PO two, PO two, and the carbon dioxide and your perfusion status. Right. Another question is regarding the weaning from COVID patient that you have already addressed. That these patients who are developing pulmonary fibrosis, they are having different macro or micro thrombus, leading to a prolonged weaning, and sometimes they are recurrent tracheostomy. I just have one comment regarding the use of BNP. at least at least in my practice we are not using bnp or anti pro bnp uh, for winning purpose because a lot of studies have shown it is not a very great good marker for volume status in a septic patient and it also indicates the severity of the disease and the prognosis of the patient so we usually do not follow anti pro bnp or bnp in severely sick patients yeah i would just add to that saying that pro bnp uh, we do not do it serially and uh, It, the serial trend also does not reflect anything at one point you can do it what where i find its role is that in many patients like when you are conducting the 2d echo there are many restrictions on the chest wall suppose there are electrodes there are many pipes which is attached to the chest wall the so many times the technician or the performer finds an inadequate window to conduct the test right. so in that process they actually miss what i find more often exists is the diastolic dysfunction and degree of pulmonary hypertension these two points are inadequately assessed in the trans thoracic echo due to the causes that i just mentioned for a patient who is on ventilator on multiple pipes and uh, tubes are attached so because of that when the report does not show you how much diastolic dysfunction is there or pulmonary hypertension and you see that if the pulmonary pathology is resolved patient is not improving and not coming down below a certain degree of uh, ventilator support that it comes to my mind and we usually check for pro bnp at one and that actually you know also guides us to some extent to use varying doses of uh, diuretic excellent thank you thank you dr sharmili for taking us through the excellent journey or very important journey of winning of the patient and taking those patients out of ventilator